So good to see you today. I got a question for you today. Let me ask you, what are you unsure about? What are you unsure about? Let me ask you over here. What, what are you unsure or uncertain about today? Maybe you're online today. I don't know about you. I'm unsure how well this sermon's going to go. <laughs> right? I'm uncertain about how my kids are going to end up. I'm unsure about how the market, the stock market's going to work, right? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're, we're just about unsure at times about almost everything. Am I right? In fact, when you think about the Holy Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, much of it is speaking to our uncertainty and challenging us to continue to believe to not give up. In the Old Testament, God is anointing prophets, priests, and kings. And they're speaking words of, of discipline at times, of correction at times, but on the other side of it, they're bringing words of encouragement. Don't forget what he did. And I know there's a big sea in front of you, but he's going to make a way. And even on the other side, there's a land that he's promised you. Don't, don't forget about, right? There's that sense. And then you see it in the New Testament. In fact, we, we know that we read the end of the book in Revelation that, that there's a blessed hope for every believer. We'll talk about that today. But what are you unsure about? Now, let's flip the question around and can I ask you, what are you sure about? Or in the words of the great theologian, Oprah, <laughs> she used to say, what do you know for sure? You don't know that was one of the books that she wrote and one of the main questions that really set her apart as one of the elite interviewers of her time. What do you know for sure? What would you say? We're here in 1 John chapter 5, and we are concluding our series on 1 John. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And so we're coming to the end. This is the final chapter of the book, and this is also the final week of this series. But John wants the church at Asia Minor, and I believe also us today, to be sure of our position in Jesus and our citizenship of heaven. Like, he wants us to be sure of that. John would love that if, if Oprah got you up on stage today and asked you, what do you know for sure? You might say, I'm not sure about my waistline. I'm not sure about my bank account, but let me tell you one thing I'm sure about is my citizenship and my position in Jesus and in heaven. And John is convinced as he's writing to the church, he's convinced that when you have that assurance that you will approach your every day with a confidence. And you and I, we have a decision to make because we can either conjure up confidence and try to manipulate confidence or we can allow our creator who made us to instill in us by his spirit a confidence towards the future. And so if you're here today and you're a believer, I pray that these next few minutes together that John would speak to you, and I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you through the word, and would strengthen your confidence in Jesus, and as a result, strengthen your confidence as you approach your marriage and as you approach your job as you approach that deal that has not been done yet, and as you approach disciplining your children and walking through life. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, I'm so excited and honored that you're here today. And my prayer is that you would take the next few minutes and just consider what it would look like for you to make a decision to follow Jesus. Because I'm telling you, I happen to be in a room full of people that know it's the greatest decision that you could ever make. Can I get a good amen to that today? And so let me show you in scripture, this is what John says. He's finishing up chapter five and he says, I'm writing these things to you. So all the, everything that's been written up until this point, he is now bringing a, a conclusion to. And he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know. If you're writing anything down today, I've titled this message, So That You May 
know. Tap your neighbor and say, so that you may know. Come on. I hate it when preachers do that to me. (laughs) So that you may know. Know what? Know that you have eternal life. And then he says, the result of knowing that you have an eternal life is this. This is the what? Confidence we have in approaching God. And not just approaching our creator, but also approaching creation. In everything, we can have a confidence that doesn't have to be conjured up. It doesn't have to be manipulated, but it can come from the creator. And John is convinced here that the, the, the sequence of it is, first of all, us knowing where we're going and what we're looking like in heaven. And from that position, now approaching today. Now, I want to give you four characteristics of a confident Christian according to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. We started out at 13. Now let's go back to verse 1 if you have your Bibles there. Here's the first characteristic, and it's this. It's that confident Christians believe that Jesus is the Christ. That they believe that Jesus is the Christ. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. It says this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. I want to break this down just quickly here today. It did not say everyone who gives to Christ or attends church or serves their neighbor. I think those are results of believing, but they do not secure any type of confidence in your life. Because last time I checked, it doesn't say that we work towards Christ. We simply believe in what Jesus has done. And that word believe in the Greek simply means this, to think to be true. So first of all, it just starts with a thought, but then it moves on from there. And then it's to be persuaded of. And then it's to, it's to place confidence in. So it, remember, Jesus says in the Gospels that even the demons believe. So it, it's not just about knowing that Jesus is a God, but it's, it's believing, it's being persuaded towards, it's, it's almost like your belief is pulling you towards him. And so confident Christians start at step one, not working towards salvation, but believing in receiving salvation in their life. And it's not only believing, but it's believing that Jesus is the Christ. That word in the Greek simply means anointed Messiah. He's the only one that can take away the sins of the world. Where am I getting at? What I'm saying is that you sitting in a pew doesn't make you saved no more than me walking into a garage makes me an automobile. Right? So what, what, what we know is that there's, there's a follow-up to that belief, and it's not just that Jesus is a good man. It's not that Jesus is just a good guy or, or one of the gods. No, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. All the prophecies of the Old Testament are pointing to him, that he is the one that would come and take away the sins of the world. He is the Lamb of God. And he showed up over 2,000 years ago. And as a result of that, he lived a sinless life. He died a sinner's death. And I've got good news today. Three days later, he resurrected from the dead. There is no grave for our God today. And if you believe that, guess what? You're saved. There's no other thing you have to do to get saved. Last time I checked, the cross doesn't partially cover you. It's not an unfinished work. It's a finished work. And so when we believe, guess what? We are then, if we go back to verse 1, we believe that Jesus, then we become born. What does that mean? I, last time I checked, you guys are already born. You beat out all everybody else out of your mother's womb. You win. You made it. You're already a winner. You were born a winner. I don't want to get too graphic with that one. But we are born, and we're born of, of God. In other words, if you believe, here's what happens. You get born again. And here's the beautiful thing about that. 
is that now you become a child of who? Who are you born of? Born of God, right? Guys, this gives you confidence. You may have cheated in your life. You are no longer a cheater. You may have failed in that previous marriage. You are no longer a failure. You are now a child of God. And you say, that makes no sense. Maybe you've been in jail. Maybe you've made, made decisions. Maybe you've cheated on your taxes. Maybe you've cheated on other people. Guess what? Because of your belief in the finished work of Jesus, you are now identified as a child of God. And even though you make mistakes, they don't get to define you in any form or fashion. Only your creator gets to define you. Why? Because you were born as a person and as a sinner, but you got born a again. I don't know about you, but that gives me confidence. If I, whether, whether my coworker or my, my boss wants to label me as whatever they want to label me, last time I checked, they are not my creator. And they don't get to decide how I define myself. And so guess what? It puts a little bit of confidence in me to approach today. Are you with me today? Second thing is this, is confident Christians follow Jesus first lead others second. Now listen, God's called you to lead. And I'm calling out more in your leadership, but he's called you to lead second and follow first. You are a father second, follower first. If you own a business today, you are not the leader of the business as a Christ follower, you want confidence in your business, put the Lord at the center of the business. Yes, on paper, you are the president with your bylaws. I get that. But you know in your heart as a follower that he is actually the president. And so you lead strong and you lead well, but you know inside as a follower of Jesus that you are leading second and following Jesus first. In verse 3 of uh, 1 John chapter 5, it says that here's how we know that we love God. We follow his commandments. Not our own directives, but his commandments. And so we are followers first, leaders second. Let me make it like this. If you become the next president of the United States, let me just tell you, we're going to vote for you, all right? You got our constituency. But when you become the next president of the United States, you are a follower first, president second. And I don't know about you, but that brings confidence in my life when I realize that the creator that can perform miracles, that can tug on the hearts of kings and queens, is directing my family, is directing my business, is directing who I'm going to end up marrying and who I'm going to end up working at, and the doors that I can't open. I'm telling you, it's a place of confidence. You do this, if you're the leader of your life, good luck. And I really mean that. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just saying, when you put yourself first, that's a lot of pressure, and you were never designed to be the creator. You were designed to be the creation. So if God tells you to do something, guess what? <laughs> do it. Make it happen. He tells you to pick something up, pick it up. He tells you to put something down, put it down. He tells you to give, give. I want to tell you a story about what happened this last week. There was a woman in rehab, and she's quite a few months pregnant. She's about two or three months away from, from her pregnancy day. And she does not, we, we found out, Iris, one of our team members here, found out that she did not, not only did she not have a diaper or a piece of clothing for her child. She did not have one article of clothing for herself as she was in a rehab center and finally getting on the way out. So Iris got wind of that and reached out to our MOPS ministry here, which is mother of preschoolers. Are there any MOPS ladies in the room today? Okay, all, all two of you. Awesome. Um, and uh, this is a picture of, of some of the MOPS women. And just in about a couple hours, they just sent a group text out and said, hey, there's somebody in need. Can we do something? They felt like this was something that they were supposed to pick up. And within about two hours, these ladies uh, raised over $300 that they were able to give to Iris. Can we put the next picture up? 
And here's this mom, and here's all the stuff that they were able to get just to start out with. Come on, it's awesome. We really are better together, aren't we? Now listen, you're not called to reach every need, but you are called to reach a need. We can't reach everybody, but we can do something. You know Jesus did that? You know there are times when he would leave the city and go to the next one. And it wasn't that the city was finished. He was on mission to go to the next one. I just want to take the burden off of you because sometimes we can think that, 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 that the goal is that we're supposed to reach every need. And you know what happens? We end up not reaching any needs because we just feel terrible about it. We feel like there's a superhero complex that all of a sudden comes on you and you're not the hero. We're simply following first, right? Leading second. And so here's a group. They got together and they don't meet every need, but they were able to meet this need. You can do the same thing. And I love what it says in verse 3. It says, his commands are not burdensome. I just love that. His commands are not burdensome. Third thing today, characteristic of confident Christians, is that they make God's story their story. The Bible says this in verse 9 of 1 John chapter 5. It says, we accept human testimony. That's true, right? We, we accept the stories of the people around us. But here's what he says. But God's testimony is greater. In other words, you have your own story. But one of the attributes of your spiritual formation in Jesus is when your story becomes his story. And then we find ourselves looking where we fit into his story. In in the book of Romans, Paul specifically talks about this word grafted in. This idea that in the New Testament, I don't want to get too deep and theological here, but in the New Testament, we are grafted into the story of the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament isn't just the old covenant that we forget about. It's our heritage that we are still a part of today. Am am I right? And so we accept this because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about us, his, his son. There's a book, uh, there was a professor I had in school uh, during, during my work there, and it was a, uh, my professor was Leonard Sweet, and he wrote this book called From the Tablet to the Table. Leonard Sweet is an excellent writer, and if you, uh, if you like to read books, you would really enjoy the way he writes. And he challenges, uh, he challenged us in class, he also challenges uh, anybody that reads this book, that there's something powerful about the Jewish traditions that we could uh, benefit from if we took some of their practices, not as religion, not as rules, but it is a part of our heritage. And here's what he talks about. Very, very simply, one of the biggest takeaways I had was that he challenges the American people that are Christian to include the kids at the table. As simple as it is, if you don't watch it, you get around at Thanksgiving and the kids are in a separate room and the adults talk big, big talk and the kids talk small talk. And in a Jewish culture, that just doesn't happen. The kids are in the deep theology early on. And obviously, you have to be wise about it. And, you know, I'm not talking about talking about ridiculous stuff. But here's what he says on page 133 of the table. He says this, children belong at the table, at la mesa. They can be a pain. And all the parents said amen. (laughs) And they may ruffle the tidiness of the table, all the parents said. Amen. But if your eschatology is strong... They become a joy and a pleasure. Here's where he's getting at. One of the role, one of the main roles of a Jewish father is to have that eating meals at the table was first of all looked at as spiritual and not just practical. And that one of the main roles of the father was to tell the story around food. And that here's here's what here's what the study is in the book. The question they were asking is, why are there so many Jewish people that have more Pulitzer Prizes, more academies, more Golden Globes? Like, what is it about this small group of people that they're, they're so successful? And one of the reasons that he talks about is because early on, they're finding themselves in their Jewish story, okay? So here's what happens. When a, when a young boy turns 13, he knows who he is. And while most American kids at 13 have no clue who they are. So at 13 years old, they're creating from a place of foundation. While the rest of the world is still trying to figure out who they are all the way into their 20s. 
And so they're starting businesses at 21, at 19. And some would attribute it back to the fact that the father kept telling them the story. All I'm saying is that one of our attributes is that his, his testimony becomes greatest in our lives. So when we read the text next time, next, this next week, when you read the Bible, you're not just reading it for information or even just for devotion. You're finding yourself in the story. So Moses crosses the Red Sea. You're crossing the Red Sea. And then if we realize that Jesus is actually leading us across the Red Sea. When Judas portrays Jesus, guess what? There's part of you and me that have betrayed Jesus. We find ourselves in a story, amen? And what happens, the powerful part of that is that your story doesn't end well without him. So how do you get confidence if your story ends with you? But when your story ends in his story, the logical conclusion is to be confident in your life. It is our blessed hope. Which brings me to point number four as we close. is confident Christians know they ultimately win. First John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. John uses the word victory. Let's see how he says it. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? John's trying to just build you up today. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'm here to tell you today that even if you are experiencing defeat currently, you still will end up in victory. And it is possible for you to walk in victory and still experience defeat. And so you may be walking through, I don't know who this word is for today. You may, everything around you may seem like you are a failure. Maybe people have told you that, or maybe you've looked in the mirror and told yourself that. But I'm here to tell you that if you believe today and you are a child of God today, he gets to decide who you are. And even though you may seem like you're defeated in the moment, I'm here to tell you that you can still walk in victory. Why? If it was your story, you can't walk in victory. But when it's his story, we know how this thing ends. And I'm grateful today that we have the word of God to encourage our faith, to continue in the path of him, to not give up, to not grow weary. And I'm so thankful that God inspired John on the island of Atmos, of Patmos to give us the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation tells us, it gives us hope for the future, that no matter what happens right now, we have a destiny ahead of us. We have an assurance ahead of us. We have a blessed assurance that we get to have. And John is saying, when you have that assurance, you can walk in confidence today. So God, I don't need another real great song. I don't need the worship team to get crazy. I'll I can stand on your word and it's the logical conclusion for me to walk out of here and be confident that even though I don't know how this business deal is going to work out, even though I'm in between jobs right now, even though my kids are far, far, far away from the Lord, even though I don't know how the interest rates are ever going to come down again, I can trust in you and I can have confidence in you that you are working all things out for my good. And I'm here to tell you today that if God's not done until it's good, And if it's not good, God is not done. And I'm so grateful today. So you know what? Last time you prayed, nothing moved. You can walk in defeat or you can still have the confidence because God didn't change who he was. And so we believe again. We, we, We keep striving for our walk with him. And so in conclusion, confident Christians, let's move this on here. If you're writing anything down, these are are all the points right here. Confident Christians believe that Jesus is the Christ, right? We're not just attending or following. We're believing, and out of that, the attendance, the following, the, the serving comes. Confident Christians, we follow Jesus first and lead others second. Confident Christians, we make God's story or his testimony greater than our story and our testimony. So we're fine. We're not just opening up the Bible this week to get a word because we're supposed to. We're, we're jumping into the story. We're jumping into our, our story. And parents, we're teaching our kids the story, right? And confident Christians number four is that we know 
that they ultimately win, no matter if we're experiencing defeat right now. A young woman in the late 1800s was having eye issues. When I say a young woman, she was six weeks old. You know, in the 1800s, it wasn't the same type of medical treatments like we have today. This young girl, six weeks old, was having trouble with her eyes. So mom and dad took her to the doctor, and the doctor tried something new, created this paste, put it in her eyes, and ruined her eyes. She went from barely being able to see to never seeing again. And that woman went on to write 500 hymns of praise to the Lord. Her name is Fanny Crosby. And she wrote many hymns that you would know, but one of them that you definitely would know. She wrote the hymn, Blessed Assurance. I want to read you just a few lines because Fanny had every reason to be defeated. She had every reason to get bitter. And instead, she got better. She turned her pain into praise. Here's what these words say. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. So this is what she says over 200 years ago. She says, so this is my, if I know it, story. This is my story song, praising my Savior all the day long. Now, the second verse is what, what caught me up this week and got me emotional. She said, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Y'all, she couldn't even see. Wow. What a faith. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. So I asked you earlier, what are you sure about? I want to ask you again today, what are you sure about?